He is perhaps the one person who is universally respected by all nationalists in Britain. <laughs> How much am I paying you for so much? Not Griffin. He's a person who I'm, I think you, you all know. So without further ado, please join your hands together and give a warm round of applause for Richard Edwards. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, um, fellow patriots, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the warm applause. Um, my speech is going to be on an entirely different plane to that of the two earlier speakers. I'm not going to talk about genetics, um, I'm not going to talk about the diversity of the genetics, I'm not going to talk about race futurism, I'm going to talk about the fact that the whole Western world is bankrupt. In particular, all the governments of the Western world are bankrupt. And I can tell you that when we was waiting at our first uh, rendezvous point at that tube station by that present um, park there, I was looking at all the tourists walking around eating their ice creams and eating their burgers and all that. And I was looking at them and thinking how happy they look eating their ice creams and their burgers. And I thought to myself, little do they know, the whole lot of them are bankrupt and the bailiffs, the bailiffs will be calling very, very soon. But if that's not true of them personally, it's certainly true of their governments. Um, the Greek government has gone bankrupt. The government of Portugal has gone bankrupt. Uh, the government of South Southern Ireland has gone bankrupt at an earlier stage. And that is going to be the, that will be the fate. Every government in the Western world, including the British government, the German government, and uh, the government of the United States of America, they are all facing bankruptcy. Yeah, yeah. The whole lot. Um, listen, I'm going to quote an authoritative source here, like the earlier speaker. These are the words aren't coming from me. I'm going to quote here the, the, the editorial at the Times on the day following the last general election, the general election of the year 2010, um, the Times printed this editorial whilst the votes were still being counted, but they knew the results. The Times said, well, how it works. The Times, what's the fact? The Times said, Britain is in the grip of a brewing, ongoing economic crisis. The opening words, were contemptuous of the politicians. The opening words of this editorial on the day following the last general election were openly contemptuous of the politicians with the phrase they use in their first sentence, the rhetorical flight of the election campaigns are now over. Second sentence, the burden of government awaits. Third sentence, the, per the perilous state of the economy and the public finances overweighs everything else. The perilous state of the public finances overwhelms everything else. The fact is, we're talking here, I'm going to talk about Britain, because I'm a British person living in Britain, but what I'm going to say applies to every Western government. The British government spends <coughs> up here, and its income is down here. And there is a huge deficit, and each year, the British government, in supporting our basic standard of living, in keeping the infrastructure of this country going, the British government, each year, on our behalf, borrows £130 billion. Pounds. Now, a billion is a thousand million. And the British government borrows £130,000 million pounds a year to support our basic standard of living, um, to, to pay for the pensions, to pay for the health bill, the education bill, um, the defence, the local government. Here is um, the public expenditure of the last year. The British government spent on our behalf £700 billion pounds on our behalf and had to borrow, that sum, and had to borrow to balance its books, £130 billion. Pounds. In fact, the British government, like every Western government, 
I tell you, I've got this life down here. I've given this speech a number of times. I used to be a member of another party, a British, <laughs> British Nationalist Party. I'm no longer a member of that British Nationalist Party. I'm now a member of another British Nationalist Party. That's the state of chaos we're in. <laughs> well, that's a fact. We're in a state of chaos. Yeah. I'm not, not going to talk about the problems of British nationalism. I'm going to talk about the problems of the British people living in a country that... Should I say effing well bankrupt? Maybe it's a phrase in presence of ladies. The fact is, we're bankrupt. Um, and people have been shocked. People have no idea. These are nationalists who give their nines to, to politics. That the British government borrows millions of pounds, sorry, billions, billions of pounds each week just to keep this show going. In fact, the British government, like all Western governments, is in a classic debt spiral yeah. in that we borrow billions each week and every week the British government has to pay out a billion pound each week just to service the debt of all the vast sums that the British government has borrowed over the, over the years. In fact, the British government spends more money servicing the debt than it does on, um, on defence, for example. In spite of the fact we've got troops fighting these, you know, godforsaken wars in godforsaken parts of the world, the British government spends more money on servicing the debt than it does in paying for the, for the defence. Um, so, um, and the fact is, to, in, look, these sums are enormous. You have to factor them down to make them real. And I've done that for you. An obliging nationalist. <laughs> and my friends say nice things about me. So the facts are this for every five pounds that the British government spends on benefits, pensions, health, education, I'm reading out the list here from the on the budget, defence, local government, law and order, the police, for every five pounds that they spend, four pounds is raised conventionally by taxes, VAT. And the fifth pound is borrowed. The fifth pound is borrowed. And it is this enormous scale of borrowing that caused the Times to talk about Britain is in the grip of a brewing economic crisis. This came out two years ago, following the last general election. The perilous state of the economy and the public finances. Now, the only way to understand these vast sums is to work them down. What does all this mean for the average British family? What does it mean for your families and for my families, the fact that the government, our government, has to borrow £130 billion in one year just to keep this show going? What does it mean? Well, I'll do the sum for you. If we take it, we're talking here, an average British family, now I'm going to tell you, keep the sum very, very simple, I'm going to say that an average British family consists of husband, wife and three children. Or alternatively, in the modern age, husband, wife, two children and one dependent adult. We live as families and I'm going to tell you that my average family, the average family, consists of five individuals. If you then do the sum and say that it's 55 million Britons, Forgetting the foreigners, I'm going to come to the foreigners in a minute. <laughs> They're an important factor in all this. Yeah. They're a very important factor in the enormous debts which they, that crowd down at Westminster, have, have, have loaded onto our shoulders. But I'll come to the foreigners in a second. If one says there's a family of the average family consists of five individuals, if you take the population of Britain, of us Britons, about about 55 million, that means there's 11 million families in Britain. If you work out what £130,000 million borrowed on behalf of 11 million families works out at, it works out that every family's standard of living, the basic maintenance of the infrastructure, the payment of the pensions, the health service, the defence, it works out that every family in Britain has its basic standard of living supported by this level of government borrowing to the extent of £11,000 a year. Every one of your families, including mine, is supported. Yeah, do the sums. I, I, was in one, I was in one meeting, and there was a woman there, an intelligent looking woman, and as I was come, coming out with all these facts and figures, she was noting them down, and at the end of it, I said, have I got that right? She says, yes, you've got it right. Believe me, 
These figures are so staggering that I have checked them many, many times before I spoke at Jez's meeting, before I met you lovely ladies and gentlemen. The average, fa yes, our standard of living, the average family is, is supported by this enormous amount of £11,000 a year, which is well over £200 a week. If, and in a minute you might, uh, might see the implications of if, if for any reason that the British government could no longer go onto the international money markets and borrow this money, then our standard of living, as in Greece, would collapse overnight. Overnight. You may have seen the photograph in the Guardian newspaper about two weeks ago. It showed a queue of respectable looking people in Athens, Greece, queuing up for free food. That's what happens when a country goes bankrupt. That's what happens when a government goes bankrupt. I would just go on a slight um, detour here and put into parentheses. Um, yes, we're talking about the average British family here because we are Britons and we're responsible for this and this is our country and if our country, if our government goes bankrupt, we'll be bankrupt. But I am not forgetting the presence of these uh, foreigners in our country and I'm not forgetting that immigration permitting millions of third worlders and other foreigners into our country and giving these millions of third worlders and other foreigners in our country a first world standard of living is of course costing this country a fortune, an absolute fortune. In fact, if this was a more critical speech, I'd say that's a burden put on us deliberately to break our backs, actually. Yeah, but yeah, uh, yeah, at yeah, the yeah. moment, we'll just, we'll just stick to the, the finances. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, because I agree with every point that, the, that uh, Mrs. Linda Miller made, first of all. Let me, right, there's a whole number of questions come out of this. Question number one. Where does this money come from? Where does this money come from that we have to borrow every week? Where? There are two principal sources of this borrowing. One is that the British government borrows vast sums of money from foreigners, from foreign governments. And I'm going to name two sources. Two of the most, two of the biggest sources of this credit from their point of view and borrowing from our point of view. The first country that Britain borrows vast sums of money from is Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. Yeah, indeed. It's ominous. Because Saudi Arabia pay practically every mosque that is built in Britain is paid for by the government of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, this very extreme Muslim state, pays for most of the mosques that are built in Britain. And the question arises, is the real price, is the real price in terms of real politique, is the real price that the West in general and Britain in particular is paying for this access to all this money that we're borrowing from the um, extreme Muslim state of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia? Is it in fact the real price that we have to let in millions of Muslims into our country in exchange? No. I will remind you of the old saying, he who pays the piper calls the tune. I'm not a British nationalist for nothing, Mr. Chairman. You do understand that. <laughs> right, that's, that's that. The, the, right? At your service, ladies and gentlemen. The second source of funding that the British government goes on its knees and grovels for is China. The, not just China. The communist government, the communist government of the People's Republic of China. In fact, what I could have done, and I omitted to do it, apologies, I did it, I've shown at other meetings, I have a photograph, because Britain is not the only country that has to grovel for this money, grovel. Because when you're in debt, you have to grovel. God help anybody who looks at that last, the five pound note. Yeah, I'll show you a five pound note. <laughs> I think I've got one. Oh no, I was giving it to Des. <laughs> yeah, I'll show you a ten pound note. <laughs> if, if you've ever been in the situation where that is your last ten pound note, nothing too personal here, not on this point. But 
it's, it's a very unpleasant situation to have to grovel. Now, it's not just the British government that's in this situation, so is the, the government of the United States of America. And there's a photograph on the internet, which I took down and showed at these meetings. It shows a photograph of the President of the United States of America, a very tall chap, tall and as thin as me, but a different complexion. <laughs> okay, well, he's the President of the United States of America. He went over three years ago and want, with his begging cap, to borrow even more money from Japan, because Japan is a major source of borrowing in the United States of America. And there's a photograph of President Obama, the president of the most militarily most powerful state in the world, and Obama must have practiced for this because I couldn't do it. <laughs> and there's the little president, the little, little, little um, emperor of Japan, a tiny little guy. And Obama has so practiced, it's called kowtowing in the East, has bent right double. It's an amazing photograph to see. A representative of the most militarily most powerful state in the world begging for money. Good. In the East, it's called kowtowing. Next day, Obama went to China and begged money from the president of the communist government of the People's Republic of China. Now, I can tell you that when the white man, that's the white man, right? When the white man was master of this world before we destroyed ourselves in two world wars. Where's our German speaker, by the way? Where's he gone to? He's there. Before the white man destroyed himself in two world wars, when we had an empire, because we conquered the world at one stage, being such a wonderful people, of course. Having set up the United States of America as en passant, as the French would say, en passant, setting up uh, North America, we then went and built a worldwide empire. How did we build that worldwide empire? When the Chinese gave us a bit of trouble, this is before Sternberg uh, turned up, by the way, uh, based up there in uh, Upper Mongolia, um, some years before um, Baron, the White Baron turned up, uh, we had troops in China called the Boxer Rebellion. And two of these, two British soldiers, two British sergeants, were captured by the Chinese. And the Chinese said, kowtow, kowtow. And Rudyard Kipling wrote a famous poem about the two British sergeants who wouldn't kowtow. And the Chinese put them in the snake pit. That was the end of them. That's before we had presidents and prime ministers who kowtowed. That's when the white man was still the white man before we destroyed ourselves in two world wars. However, um, so we borrow from the China. It's so dangerous and so shameful what's going on here. I'll ask a question. Now allow, please allow me. I used to be a school teacher at one time, so you allow me to ask questions. What, ladies and gentlemen, now come on, how good are you? What? is the largest reservoir in England. I shall take a swig of this lemonade while I should think it out. <laughs> <laughs> What's the water? Yeah, there's all good stuff this. Oh, no, so I'm going to talk, sorry. Somebody at Peterborough. It's further north. It's yeah, further north. It's 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 no, no, that's, that's in Scotland. Scotland. England, England, England. 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 <laughs> Scotland and Wales are, are bigger than the, the, the reservoir. Anyway, I'll give you the answer. No, 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 no. <laughs> The largest, the, largest, the largest reservoir in England is the Kielder Dam and Reservoir, oh, yeah. north of Newcastle. Yeah. And when it was built in the 1920s, it was the pride and joy of the British water industry. They were very proud of this dam. It's a, the Kielder Reservoir supplies all the water for Newcastle in the whole of the northeast. It even supplies water down to Manchester. Last, <coughs> last, year, <coughs> last year, the Chinese bought the Kielder Reservoir. Last year, and this year, this year, this year, this year, this this year, the Chinese bought 10% of Thames water. 10% of the water that we drink in London is now owned by the Chinese. This, the, the politicians, the traitors, Lib Lab and Con traitors, who are ruining Britain, as their counterparts are ruining every white country in the white world, are so shameless. They're selling the, the family's silver in form of the very water that we drink. <clears throat> that is dangerous and humiliating. And hardly anybody knows these things. It's only because gents like me, gents like me, read the Financial Times on your behalf. <laughs> <laughs> and then photocopy it in the public library. I don't pay a quid for this thing. I know what a £10 note looks like, and I don't pay a quid for this. Go to the public library. Huh?
and that's what I find out. So, that is one major source of, of funding for the British government, is borrowing from countries abroad. The other major, the other major funding source is, and I choose my words with great care, the incestuous and very improper relationship between the Bank of England on the one hand and the British government on the other. Yeah. In that the Bank of England is producing credit out of nothing in a process called quantitative easing. It's a very dangerous process because they're creating credit, they're lent, the, the, British, the Bank of England creates credit out of nothing and then lends it to the British government um, in a process known as quantitative easing. Now it's very, it is very dangerous because it is potentially very inflationary for our government to spend money which somebody has just printed in the printing presses or in the modern world just put uh, so many digits on a computer screen. When this process started, it was a temporary emergency, um, um, a, a temporary emergency back in the year, three, year, three years ago, 2009, at the height of the banking crisis, when the banking crisis first struck the United States of America, then Britain, then the rest of the white world, um, when it was seriously feared, three years ago, when these major US banks were going bankrupt, Burns, Stairs and, and other sort of banks uh, were going bankrupt, and it was seriously feared that the banks would run out of credit. It was seriously feared back then in 2009 that these cash machines would have no notes in them, that the banks would have no notes. And to get over what was regarded or described at the time as a temporary uh, emergency yeah. measure, they produced quantitative easing, they produced 75 billion pounds worth of credit. Seven, five, followed by nine noughts. And somebody, of course, just put it on a computer screen. Seven, five, nine noughts with a pound sign in front. Um, because it is potentially so dangerous at, at creating inflation, a runaway inflation, quantitative easing was meant to be followed by its twin, QT, QE, followed by QT, quantitative tightening, to, bring the, to take the credit out of circulation to neutralise the, the potential effect of um, inflation. Now, in fact, <coughs> surprise, surprise, <laughs> yeah, surprise, surprise, quantitative tightening has never been um, brought about, never. They have, they, have, they have introduced tranche after tranche of quantitative easing, which is now the original 75 billion has now reached 325 billion, which is 325,000 million pounds of credit, created just like that, out of nothing. And I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I'll do the sum for you, I'll do the sum for you, which I've checked it several times. I had this lady in my audience in Leicestershire two years ago, checking it all for me. She did it very well. It's, it's nice, because each one of us, each one of us, as we walk around, has got a sort of, um, Invisible but very, very real, six thousand pounds worth of oh, yeah, yeah. on top of our heads. Six thousand over every one of us. Fifty-five, fifty-five million Britons has got six thousand pounds worth of quantitative easing, rather like a sort of sword of democ democracy, actually. And every time we go to the shops, every time we buy something, you've got an avalanche. Every one of us of six thousand pounds rushing down at you in an uncontrolled um, inflation. That is called quantitative easing. They have no plans to do anything about it. In fact, as we s debate here, on Monday or the following Monday, the Bank of England, at a mile or two down the road, is going to announce its big decision. The next tranche of quantitative easing is either going to be another 50 billion, oh, that's peanuts, as they say in North America. <laughs> Gee, man, that's peanuts. Think big, man, think big. It's going to be a hundred billion, a hundred billion, because fifty billion doesn't have any effect. Like the drug addicts, they've got to have a bigger fix. And I tell you, these governments are as addicted, are as addicted to debt as some junkie down the road. And we're talking about our government, the British government, the same with the German government or the American government. They are addicted to debt. It is very, very dangerous, and uh, greatly to be deplored. You can see why the Times, which knew a thing or two, talked about Britain 
being in a very, very dangerous situation. Perilous is the word they use. That's the day after. Never mind the politicians. The rhetorical flight. This is how the, this is how the editorial starts. The rhetorical flights of the election campaign are over. In other words, ignore the trash. Lib yeah. Lab and Con, they're junkies, they're trash. The burden of government waits. The perilous state of the country's finances. I will conclude this and wrap this up. Uh, I know it's all been very factual, um, but you know, it's bread and butter. Bread and butter, our bread and butter. Think of that queue in Athens. All these respectable people queuing up for loaves of bread. They were giving away loaves of bread in Athens. So the question arises, how did we get into this situation? How, does it, how did it come about that we, we need to borrow billions from the communist government of the People's Republic of China? How did that come about? Answer, because the goods that we need and the goods that we buy are practically all made in the cheap labour countries of the Far East. Now, I don't know about you, but my background is as an engineer, and it interests me to see where things are made. I just, when I'm in the shop, I look, where is it made? And whether you're talking about television sets, or components for um, computers, or knitting needles, practically everything is made in the People's Republic of China. And I'll tell you, even, 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 men's underwear is made overseas. And I'll tell you, in case you don't know, because when I buy pants, I buy pants like everybody else buys pants, I look to see where they're made. And sometimes the pants that I buy are made in Indonesia. Sometimes the pants that I buy, I'm not going to tell you what shop I buy from, because you might all boo me out the room. So I'm the, boo, you don't buy there. And I would reply, well, doesn't everybody? <laughs> anyway, the pants that I buy over a period of years, of course, um, have either been made in Indonesia, <laughs> Egypt, or Tunisia. They are never made, never made in Lancashire anymore. Never made in Lancashire. Never made in Lancashire. Um, that we are so dependent, that we are so dependent on buying this stuff from foreign countries is a direct result. None of this has happened, but somebody said earlier, none of this happens by accident. It's all been thought out and planned. The Dumbos, look, I, I admire the British, I admire the white race, we are wonderful people. But there's no doubt that over the years we've turned our brains off. There's no doubt we've turned our brains yeah. off. There's no doubt that we've got our brains in bloody neutral. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> however, however, I have no doubt that we will solve every one of our problems. Now, how about that as a promise from the, from the, from the speaker? Every problem will be solved. We've got a round of applause for that. If you want to know how to get a round of applause, just say, every problem will be solved. And I'm going to, listen, I keep to my word, I keep to, I'm going to tell you how I'm going to solve these problems. Otherwise, I couldn't have come here. All this is a direct result of a process known as globalization. Globalization is the deliberate destruction of frontiers, the deliberate destruction of protective trade barriers, the deliberate, the deliberate globalization is the deliberate destruction of countries and nations and ultimately races and peoples, of course. And, and, yeah, that's part of it. Now, this is all a result of a decision taken here in London and in parallel in the United States of America during the time of the government of Margaret Thatcher and at the time of the, of the presidency of Ronald, of Ronald Reagan. A decision was made to to produce unlimited free trade worldwide. Unlimited free trade worldwide. And the city of London here and Wall Street in New York were liberalized, a process called liberalization. In London, the, 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 the phrase that they used colloquially was the Big Bang. And the city of London and Wall Street New York were allowed, encouraged, permitted, and definitely encouraged to invest vast sums of money, British capital, US capital respectively, in the cheap labour countries of the Far East to, uh, to employ the highly disciplined, the highly disciplined and very, very cheap labour of those countries in 
China, South Korea, working for pennies in the pound. That's what it's all about, employing these highly uh, disciplined <coughs> Chinese, etc., working for pennies in the pound, cents in the dollar. If you like, I'll give you an example of my own experience in this. Forty years ago, because I, you know, I, think, I think to myself, how do these things actually happen? Why do, why do they happen? And how do they happen? And I'll tell you, 40 years ago, I was an engineering student. Right? One of the most happiest times of my life, actually. Hard work, but most enjoyable. Engineering is wonderful. Only one thing more interesting, nationalist politics. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I was an engineering student. We used to have these lectures, lectures. And one day, the lecturer had been a managing director of a major British car manufacturing company, Austin Morris, as they called themselves at the time, a British Leyland, and changed names. So <laughs> this man, whose name was George Turnbull, a top engineer, came to us engineering students and said to us, words to this effect, boys, or however Harry addressed us, the future is in the Far East. We all looked, because it was all, all engineers are patriots. Engineers are patriots. All the other trash are the social scientists. <laughs> <laughs> the Marxists and all them. But us engineers, us engineers, if that grammar is correct, are, um, we're, um, we're all very patriotic. What was he talking about? And what he said was this. He said, we, we are going to set up brand new factories, state-of-the-art technology, greenfield sites in South Korea. We're going to build cars in South Korea. We thought, oh, goodness me, goodness me. Anyway, I've never forgotten that, because it's sort of stuck in my mind. The fact is, whether you know it or not, South Korea produces vastly more cars per year than Great Britain does, vastly more. That's all done with British money, British, British capital, British technology, and it's British engineers who set it up. Because engineers just love building things. They, they, they didn't really understand what they were doing, I don't suppose. They just love building things. Give them, a, give them the machines and the factories, they just set to and they start doing it, you know. But there was the plan 40 years ago. And now, why don't they make car Ford of Dagenham? Doesn't make any cars anymore. They make car engines, but they don't make cars. British Leyland, all gone kaput. Do you know who owns the big British Leyland plant? Daft. Daft and Holland <laughs> own it. No, it's now owned by the Chinese. The Daft bought it out of it. Yeah, but it's now owned by the Chinese. And who owns Volvo in Sweden? Chinese. The Chinese. <laughs> and the biggest plant in Britain was at Longbridge plant in Birmingham? Chinese. Chinese own it. Who, who owns Jaguar cars? India. India, 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 correct. And Land Rover. And Land Rover. Was once owned by Volkswagen, who I think bought it as a joke, actually. The biggest container port in England, Felix, was owned by the Chinese. We, the traitor, we, the family silver. London Metal Exchange as well, Yeah, a guy who calls himself Paul, Lord Paul, an Indian who calls himself Lord Paul. So, we are being destroyed, and I'm just talking about the financial aspect of all this. Um, so, 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 listen, listen, I said, I said, when I came here, I'd give you the solution. Because I could not address these meetings, and I couldn't be a nationalist if I didn't know what the solution is. And the solution to all these financial problems, and the de-industrialization of the West, which is part of this problem, which is part, of, a deliberate part of this scheme of globalization, is the de-industrialization of the West, and the outsourcing of our jobs to the cheap labour countries that is far, the cheap labour countries of the Far East. The solution is um, to all these problems is to be found in the application of the principles of economic nationalism. And this is my last sentence, because it gives a bit of time for questions or whatever, different views or your wrapping up. Is. The principles of economic nationalism are that we live within our means, mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. everything we need, that what we need we build ourselves, and that we rebuild British industry, and we employ British people again. Thank you very much.